to start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very, very much, for all of you, for coming. I think we've had a great turnout, and we've got people here from the Interfaith Forum, Essex Police, Essex County Council, university students, um, and we've got staff as well, lots and lots of people here. So it's really great to see you all. Um, I am the Muslim chaplain here. Some of you might not know the other hat that I wear, because I wear a lot of hats. And um, one of my roles is I'm the Muslim chaplain here. And through that role, um, I decided to do a talk on the history of Islam in Britain. Um, international students started here last week, and I felt it would be really good for them to understand um, the immigration of Islam into this country, because a lot of people think Islam is a new religion and has only just come here, really, um, after 9-11. But a lot of people don't understand Islam has been here a long, long time and has contributed to Britishness as well. So let's find out um, about the history of Islam into Britain. Now, if we look at this chart here, this will show us that Islam actually came after Judaism and Christianity, which means that it must have come into Britain later as well. So Christianity and Judaism was already here, and then Islam came here. Can anybody tell me what century they think Islam came to England? Any ideas? Eighth. Eighth. Well done. How did you know that, then? Oh, I knew it. I knew it, because nobody can get that answer unless they look it up. Because normally I get answers like 18th or 19th century. So that is correct. It is actually 8th century. And if we look at this, so there's um, Islam, which comes after Judaism and Christianity. And if we look at this map, um, Islam actually first started in Arabia, and it was only really in these two regions, Medina and Mecca, and a little bit here on the outskirts of Arabia. And that was due, during the Islamic Caliphate in 632. And then later on, by 661, Islam had spread to most of Arabia. All of these countries are all labelled with their modern names. In those days, it was all Arabia. So this is Islam has now spread by 661. And then this was the greatest era. This was during the Umayyad Empire, where Islam spread even further. And by 750 AD, Islam had spread all the way up to here, into Spain, and that is where it went into Europe here. Yeah. So there's Morocco and Spain. So one of the very first immigrants, if you like, Muslim immigrants into England were the traders. And they hit lots of ports within England, and they were there to sell perfume, spices, clothes, um, clothing, gold, um, very expensive kinds of things. So that's what they were doing. They were trading at, uh, in all the port areas and trading their lovely items to England. And we do have evidence of this. So each and every slide that I will put up, there will be evidence on there, references. So you all know that I'm not making it all up. Um. Okay. And um, it was actually in um, 773 to 774, there was a King Ofa of Mercia, and he actually minted a coin, and it was copied from some of the dinars that were being traded while the Muslims were trading from the Abbasid, Abbasid Caliphate. It actually bears the Islamic Declaration of Faith, the first testimony of faith, um, and that's written along here at the top. This coin is actually in the British Museum. So that's the proof that Islam had already come to Britain and the king was copying the very, very expensive coins without him knowing what that meant as well. He was copying the Arabic writing on the outside. And there are more coins. Here is a Christian dirham with Arabic inscriptions on it as well. That's from 1216 to 1241. And these dinars here are dating from 724 to 743, and they were actually found on a beach at Eastbourne in Sussex. And again, these pictures are taken from the British Museum. 
Okay, and then the biggest point in history, really, was in um, Baghdad, which is now Iraq, in that area, a very big house of wisdom was opened, and it was a library. There was, it was a translation institute and research center established in the Abbasid era. It was founded by Caliph Harun al-Rashid. And this is actually the time of the golden age of Islam. Has anybody heard of the golden age of Islam? If you Google the golden age of Islam, or if you go into museums and things, um, if you go into the British Museum, there is a very, very big display, a very big exhibition on the golden age of Islam. So what was, what was happening was this was um, a place... This was basically the first university. So the first university was opened by a Muslim, and scholars from all over the world would go there, and they would translate books and things into Arabic, and they would build on all the heritage there. So this is actually a topic of, of its own, which I might do in the future. Islamic scholars built upon ancient heritage where their own scientific advances Muslims excelled in art, architecture, astronomy, maths, geography, science, and history. All the maths, some of you might not like maths, that's thanks to Muslims. <laughs> Algebra, trigonometry, calculus, quadrants, decimals, Arabic numerals, and the whole concept of zero. We know, for example, in England, it was Roman numerals in the olden days, and the whole concept of the decimal system came from Arabia. So um, the whole um, concept of zero, vital to the advancement of maths, was formulated by Muslim scholars and shared with medieval Europe. The mechanics of flight, Muslims invented sophisticated instruments that made future European voyages of discovery possible, and world and navigation maps as well. Some of these inventions that took place were a direct result of the religion. So for example, the need to pray, Five times a day, clocks were invented, prayer mats were invented, compasses were invented so that we know which way to face, uh, the need that to wash ourselves five times a day, soap was invented, cleanliness, that kind of stuff. And then other inventions came later on. So here is the first map drawn by Ali Drisi, a Muslim geographer. Muslim geographers produced untold volumes of books on the geography of Africa, Asia, India, China, and the Indies during the 8th to the 15th century. These writings included the world's first geographical encyclopedias, almanacs, and roadmaps. Ibn Battula's 14th century masterpieces provide a detailed view of the geography of the ancient world. Muslim geographers far exceeded the output by Europeans regarding the geography of these regions well into the 18th century. That exact extract is actually from the British Museum, and this is the world's first map. In the Quran, it said that the world was round, and before that, everybody thought the world was square or flat. So this is the very first map that was drawn that uh, showed that the world was round. And while the traders were coming and trading at the ports, they were bringing all these ideas with them. These ideas actually ended up in Oxford and Cambridge, and, and it is there that they started learning Arabic. Arabic was then introduced into Oxford and Cambridge. And then some of all these things were then built upon. I can tell you very quickly some more inventions. These all took place from the 8th to the 13th century. We've got astrolabe, which is like a compass, tents, conservatories, carpets. We all know they came from Turkey. Crystal glass, for example, was made out of sand, and the most amount of sand you get is in a desert area, isn't it? Hydropower. The Arabs were fascinated by water, fascinated, because they didn't have any water there. So they used to play around with water, fountains, and... Um, dams and that kind of stuff to conserve water was all invented by Muslims. Steam distillation, again in the Quran it talked about evaporation of water, making clouds and then it raining and then they started experimenting to see is that true? 
So steam distillation, again needed, uh, for example, with oil as well, for the separation of all the oil that they had in Arabia. The mechanics of a clock because of the need to pray. Toothbrush and toothpaste. Soap. We'll be talking a little bit about soap later. Plasters, laboratory equipment, chemists and pharmacies. The first hospital ever wondered why is it always doctors and Muslim? So many out there, isn't there? If you go over go to the doctor's surgery, there's always a Muslim doctor in there somewhere. So this is because the heritage, genetically maybe, has come from Muslims to begin with. Um, identification and treatment of smallpox, anesthetics, antiseptics. I could go on forever. Surgical instruments and injections. Surgery and operations. This book here has got 1,001 inventions in there golden age of Islam. So if any of you want to borrow this, you're more than welcome. The front row get priority though, okay, <laughs> to borrow the book um, because you're extra important. And we've got this one here as well. Um, this is, as, if you don't want to go through the whole book, which is so big, you can have a little uh, bedtime reading one there. That is some civilization. So like I said, that is a lecture of its own, um, but you can Google Golden Age of Islam when you get back, or visit the British Museum and you can look up the exhibition which is on the Golden Age of Islam. And here is the first Arabic manuscript of the eye. And it's from this then that cameras were also um, invented. The word camera is actually from the Arabic word gumra, which means dark room. Okay? So in the 11th century, it was Al Haytham determined virtually everything that Newton advanced regarding optics centuries prior and is regarded by numerous authorities as the founder of optics. Al Haytham was the most quoted physicist of the Middle Ages. His works were utilized and quoted by a great number of European scholars during the 16th and 17th centuries. A lot of the books actually as well. Cambridge still kept some of those names as well. Okay, so as the Muslim traders are coming in, they're liaising with the British, the English, they're exchanging all these lovely ideas, and the first Arabic Quran is brought over at the ports, and it was actually an English person who translated the first Quran. The first translation of the meaning of the Quran was then put into <coughs> European languages, and it was the Latin translation made by Robert Ketton in 1143 CE. After 500 years of private circulation within the church, it was finally published by Theodore Bibliander in Basel, Switzerland in 1543. The next translation, Latin translation, was completed Iraqi in 1698 and was followed shortly by the translation of Christian, uh, I don't know how to say that, Renesius in 1721, which is the manuscript. All of these again are all displayed in the British Museum. So it was actually um, English, it was Englishmen who translated the first Qurans from Arabic into Okay, as the time goes by, we're getting now into um, further years, and the Canterbury Tales, Geoffrey Chaucer, I don't know if anybody's heard of the Canterbury Tales, very famous book. Um, it was in that book that a Muslim scientist was included. So he was actually the very first doctor, and this is a real-life painting of him. That's Razi treating a patient. His full name is Muhammad Zakaria Razi. So he is actually mentioned in that book, The Canterbury Tales. So you can tell that Islam is now slowly becoming incorporated. As people, the traders, are talking to Muslims, learning about their religion, slowly, slowly, some of them are actually converting to Islam. Does anybody know the very first person who converted to Islam is actually mentioned in a book? Does anybody know here? Have you been researching that as well? <laughs> okay, it's actually John Nelson. He was one of the earliest known Englishmen to convert to Islam. 
The Voyage Made to Tripoli is the book by Thomas Saunders in which he is mentioned. So there may have, there may have been many more that converted before him, but he is the first one recorded by name. And when someone became Muslim, they pretended to be Turkish. The reason is in this country, you were only allowed to be Church of England. And if you wasn't, then there would be big problems. And that was the way the era was in those days. But we will see the way the era changes as we go along. So they would pop a turban on and they would pretend that they were Turk. And the British liked the Turks because the great Ottoman Empire was around at the time, which was the center of the Islamic civilization. So because of that, there was um, a lot of respect, if you like, for the Turks. Okay, so the Crusades then happen, and there's a little bit of friction between Christianity and Islam. Okay, but that happened out of Europe, so that's why we're not going to cover that bit. But there was a very clever queen who came, and she made very, very good connections with the Muslims to try and mend all of this problem that had happened in the Crusades. Does anybody know which queen that was? What was that, sorry? Sheba. Not Queen of Sheba, no. Queen We're talking the about a British queen. Mm. The yes, good, well done. You've done, been doing your research really well, haven't you? Well done. So it was actually Queen Elizabeth I. She was a very, very clever queen because she made very good connections with the Muslims. And what she did was she made very good connections with the Turks, with the Ottoman Empire, and she needed them for naval assistance against the Spanish Armada. She was Church of England, and the Spanish Armada, they were all Catholics, and there was this thing about the Catholics invading Britain. So she then used um, Murad III, the Ottoman Sultan, for naval assistance against the Spanish Armada. And that references from Islam in Britain, okay? So that was very, very good. And then do you know what? She was, went past that. She was very, very clever. And what she did was she actually um, established good relations, alliances, and trade with Muslim majority countries. Mm -hmm. And she also got this man here, Abdul Uhaid bin Masood, a Moorish ambassador, and she got him and made him an ambassador to, um, to herself, to the queen, in 1600. He actually then lived in the palace. And this was so that she could form good relations with all the Muslims and carry on trading, carry on bringing all the money into the land. And this is actually a painting of him. It's in the University of Birmingham. Did you know that he actually brought turbans into fashion into Britain? And that was actually worn in the Renaissance period in England. And um, the higher classes started to dress like him. They started to wear turbans just for a short period of time. Because in those days, Muslims were classed as really rich because they were the ones bringing in all the trading goods. So people wanted to dress, if they wanted to dress rich, they would dress up like him, and because he was a good role model in the palace. Okay, so, trading is going on really, really well, okay? Queen Elizabeth is forming good relationships with the Muslims. What do you think she might do next? Would she carry on tr trading and giving all the money to Muslims, or do you think she might be clever enough to form something herself? She's got the power, hasn't she? Yes? So what she did was she thought, why not form my own trading company? Why not do that? So what she did was she joined up the Venice company, which was already there, and the Turkey company, and she formed her own company, the Levant Company. Okay? This was very, very successful. This was an English chartered company formed in 1592, formed with the purpose of regulating English trade with Turkey and the Levant. And she used a London merchant, Francis Le Levitt. And why do you think she made him dress up like a Turkish person? Why would she make him dress up like a Turkish person? Any ideas? Good, excellent. So 
she made him dress up like a Turk so all the Turkish would think he's Turkish and then they'll trade all his goods to him. So she was quite intelligent, wasn't she? So that's exactly what happened. Um, this is, a, again, a real-life portrait taken from the National Portrait Gallery of um, an Englishman, the London merchant, and she dressed him up as a Turkish person. In that way, all the Middle East and all the Arabs will think he's a Muslim, and they'll give him all the goods happily, yes? If you look like them, then, then you're like them, aren't you, yes? So all of that then happened, and the trade went really well. Did you know there were 110 ships importing spices, cloth, cottons, woolens, kerseys, the indigo dye? Because in the Middle Ages, I don't know if anyone knows that it was only, um, you know, very, very light colors or black. Basically, it was a very, very tough uh, Black actually was a, was a color you couldn't dye anything with, and all of the dyes then came from abroad. Pewter, soda ash, tin, all those kinds of things. She included more things then in the initial trading. 110 ships there were coming in from all different lands. And then she was the very first queen who made a very successful trading company. Does anybody know what the name of that company was? It was East India. Well done. So the East India Company was founded at the end of the 16th century. Its royal charter granted by Queen Elizabeth I in 1600 gave it exclusive rights to trade to India and the Far East. The company built its own shipyard at Deptford in 1609. Again, this is a painting by Robert Holm and it's displayed in the National Army Museum. So this is a picture of all the stuff, the trading. There's an elephant there, and this is probably happening in India, bringing in all the trades into England. Okay? More um, exotic stuff, like tea and, and other things. Really, really nice stuff coming over now. Such good stuff coming over in all the boats and the ships that what becomes rife on the sea? What starts happening on the sea? Pirates. Well done. Piracy starts happening. There's all these wonderful boats coming in with so many brilliant goods. Obviously, there's going to, piracy is going to increase, isn't it, on the um, sea. So this is a pirate. His name was Captain John Ward of Kent, who was an English pirate based in Morocco, and he converted to Islam. He became Yusuf Rees, okay? So, when he became Muslim, is England going to take him in? The Queen is Church of England, isn't she? Is she going to take him in? No. Is Morocco going to take him in? Let's bear in mind that the ambassador living with the Queen is from Morocco. No, the, the ambassador is with the queen. He's living in a palace. He can't go against her. So he goes, sorry, you can't go. You cannot go to Morocco either. Morocco did not let him in. So he ended up in Tunisia. And it was in Tunisia he got obsessed with birds. Okay? And so much that the locals start calling him Jack Asfor, being Arabic for sparrow. Can anybody tell me who he was? <laughs> who was this man in history? Excellent, well done. He was actually Captain Jack Sparrow. That's how he got his name. So Captain Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean was a Muslim. And there he is. Okay? And that, honestly, is, is not... Um, I'm not making it up. Look him up. He will be there. He was a Muslim. And his poor wife was English, and she was kept in England, and they had been, they separated, which is a shame, isn't it, really? Okay, 1001 Nights. I don't know if anybody's heard of Arabian Nights. The book then hits England, all through all this trading that was going on. And then some of those, the influence from that then went into Shakespeare plays and other books as well. I don't know if anybody knows the story of Leila Majnu, which is in Arabian Nights. And that story, um, a replica of that story, is Romeo and Juliet, believe it or not. Okay? But here's some more. 
The Muslim Moors had a noticeable influence on the works of George Peel. The Battle of Alcazar, for example, featured a Moorish character. And then we've got William Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice, Titus, Andronicus, and Othello. They all featured Moorish characters in there. So Othello is Moorish as well as its title character. So a lot of the influence of that book then was going into some of the writings as well. In the meantime, the Muslim traders which are coming over, they have to stay in England for a good couple of months until all their boats are empty. They can't just do a day job, sell all their goods and go back again. So there was actually a journal which was uh, published in the newspaper in 1641, and it was a document that published all the religions in London in 1641. And one of those was actually Islam. Can anybody tell me whereabouts Islam is on there? There's um, Mohammedans written there. Yeah, Mohammedans. Okay. And in those days, like I've said before, it was very difficult to be any other religion. It actually says on there a discovery of 29 sects here in London, all of which, except the first, are most devilish and damnable. So basically, Protestants was the top religion, the best one, and everything else is regarded as devilish. But like I said, as we go along the timeline, we will see how all of that completely changes. Okay, so the East India Dock Company is getting really big, and there are so many ships coming over from India, and some of those ships, they've got cooks on there, Indian cooks, yes? And the captains are Indian as well. So there was a large group of Muslims in Britain arrived in 1760. There were sailors recruited in India from Bengal to work for the British East India Company. Ships cooks came too. Many of them were from Silet in Bangladesh. And there was a man called Saik Dean Mahomet. He was the captain of the British East India Company in 1810. And he is the one who founded the first Indian restaurant. It's thanks to him he bought the first curry here. Okay? <laughs> and the way he did it, it was very interesting. His name was actually Sheikh Dean Muhammad. The way he's changed his name to make it look English to fit in, Saik Dean Mahomet. Have you noticed how he's changed his name to make it look a bit more British? And the Hindu Stain Coffee House, the way he spelt it sounds more English, whereas it's supposed to be Hindustani Coffee House. That's actually in the Morning Post um, when I looked all of the journals up, it was written in the newspaper. Does anybody want to look what he looks like? Have a look at him. There he is. That's what he looks like. Okay, he even dresses English to fit in. And this portrait is taken from the Royal Pavilion and Museums in Brighton and Hove. He was a very clever man. He couldn't speak much English, but he brought a lot of trade into Britain uh, with curries and all the rest. And then there was one thing lacking that he found. The English, and you can look this up, it's all in the history books, were not washing themselves very well. Maybe once a year, apparently, wasn't it in those days, people were washing themselves. They were scared of disease and things. Now, soap had already been invented by Muslims. In fact, alkali, the word alkali, which is used to make soap, it's the alkaline solution that makes soap, is alkali. Al-Kali, which is an Arabic word. So what he decided to do was go to Brighton and he opened the first public baths. Clever man, wasn't he? So in 1810, shampoo was introduced to England by a Muslim entrepreneur who opened Mohammed's Indian vapor baths at the beach in Brighton. And there is a book just about that. And there it is. That's a real-life um, drawing of his baths in Brighton. And Victorians from all over were going then having hot and cold showers and medicated shampoos, and he introduced Indian head massage as well there. <laughs> and then later on, washing powder and washing up liquid and all of those items came from the shampoo and all the other stuff. Which queen is now going to hit England next? Major queen. 
Good. Well done. You're all listening really well. Queen Victoria. She is crowned Empress of India. And remember, the trade has really, really increased in India by this stage. The company then drove the expansion of the British Empire in Asia. So the British were going over in India, the Indians were coming over here, and all the trade increased. And eventually then the British Empire took over India, and more Muslims came over then. There were lots of slaves who came over. Who's seen the film Victoria and Abdul that was out recently? That was a really, really good film, and that shows the story of a Muslim slave who came over and actually lived in, the, in Victoria's palace. Now, obviously there is now um, more Muslims coming into Britain, and lots of English Lots of Englishmen are becoming Muslim by looking into the Quran. We've already got an English Quran, haven't we? So there is actually three very important Englishmen who Muslims really look up to who actually established Islam here first. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about that now. This person is called William Henry Quilliam, and he is the first person who actually um, bought a building and made it into a mosque. And that was actually in Liverpool, 8 to 10, Brougham Terrace in Liverpool in 1889. And I have got a little film which I'm going to put on, which is actually a BBC film. <coughs> and you can watch that, and it's all about him. <coughs> A century ago, Liverpool was a flourishing port, and Muslim sailors from India and the Far East would have been regular visitors. This rather faded terraced house in a Liverpool suburb is where this forgotten story of Islam begins. Although it doesn't look much now, in the 19th century, this was the first mosque in England. In 1889, the house was bought by a man named Abdullah Henry Quilliam. Quilliam was a Victorian gentleman, but he was also a Muslim convert. A religious innovator who fought to change preconceptions of Islam at a time when society found it frightening and alien. And it was here that he set about doing it. Against the odds, Quilliam established this not only as a mosque, but as a flourishing Muslim institute with its own printing press and an orphanage. It was the center of Islam, not just for Liverpool, but for the whole of Britain. It's an achievement that some Muslims believe holds the key to the future of British Islam. For me, Abdullah Quilliam really is a role model. He was so ahead of his times, as it were, that he is the blueprint in, in many respects for how we, we hope to, to continue in our communities. So just who was Abdullah Quilliam? And what did he do to try and shift the prejudices of a nation? William Henry Quilliam was born in 1856. He trained as a lawyer and his religious upbringing was typical of many middle-class Victorians. It was a trip to Morocco in 1887 that seems to have marked a decisive moment in William's religious journey. Whilst he was there, he was struck by the contrast of the Muslim way of life to that of Christian Britain. When he went to Morocco, he felt that people uh, live simple lives. Uh, they live, in his view, quite moral uh, lives. Uh, and there is uh, an environment of, uh, of solidarity, depending very little on uh, whether they are wealthy or poor. And that was something that was of uh, immense significance for him. William returned to Liverpool. And a year later, he left his Christian beliefs behind and converted to Islam. But it was a highly controversial decision. 
Two years later, Quilliam opened his mosque. But this public display of devotion to Islam immediately put him on a collision course with both the Christian hierarchy and the people of Liverpool. Quilliam faced hostility uh, right from the very beginning. They were attacked on a number of occasions. We get pigs' heads being thrown into the mosque. They would congregate mobs outside the mosque who would start jeering. It raised hackles. There's no doubt about that. In the face of such opposition, the mosque seemed to have an uneasy future. Yet within 20 years, Quilliam had nearly 500 followers. He'd been made the official representative of Islam in Britain by the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And he was starting to play a central role in the civic life of Liverpool. So how exactly did he achieve this extraordinary transformation? William's genius was to analyse why Victorians despised Islam and begin to address their prejudice. And the best sources for studying exactly how he did this are his regular publications. They include a newspaper for Muslims called The Crescent, which gives an insight into how Quilliam increased Islam's credibility through lectures at the mosque. I think it's interesting to look at the topics of these lectures because you might expect them to be religious and promoting Islam and from the Quran or whatever. But what we find is a lecture which says, with experiments um, by Professor Nuruddin Stevens, a science lecture, Sugar and Saccharines, by Professor Samuel Cleanan, PhD. William knew that one of the key criticisms against Islam was that it was narrow-minded. It didn't embrace the new scientific discoveries of the 19th century. These lectures met such criticisms head-on. So, so he's presenting Islam in a very rational way that's going to appeal, in, in a sense, to the new scientific consciousness um, of Victorian Britain. These events drew converts. And as numbers grew, so did Quilliam's profile. It wasn't long before the mosque was attracting important guests from abroad. In 1897, Queen Victoria held celebrations for her Diamond Jubilee. One of the visitors was a general from the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. But he didn't just visit the Queen, he also made his way to Quilliam's mosque. It was recorded in the Crescent. Here's the main feature article of this particular edition, uh, and I just love this, you know, here we are in the centre of Liverpool, at Lime Street Station, and there's all these Muslim converts with their fares and their flags, you know, receiving this very powerful figure. Such visits impressed the locals and gave Muslims the sense of being an important part of city life. And in the mosque, as converts straddled the social divides and clerks rubbed shoulders with explorers, it seemed that Islam was no longer an alien faith practiced only by foreign sailors. William's high-profile guests, his lectures, and the type of converts they drew seemed to have achieved the impossible. Islam was starting to be integrated into British society. But just as Quilliam was at the height of his success, everything changed. In June 1908, he and his eldest son left on what was supposed to be a six-week trip to Istanbul. No one knows exactly why, but without any warning, they mysteriously disappeared. After uh, some months, his youngest son, who stays behind, begins to dismantle everything there. Abdul Quilliam had created. The properties are sold, um, and effectively the Liverpool Muslim community comes to an end. With the disintegration of Quilliam's mosque, the outlook for Islam in Britain appeared uncertain. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that, a little bit of film. Um, this is, sorry, this is actually the Crescent, the very first 
um, issue, um, which was issued in 1893. These are all actually online, so you can look up that website there. Or I can email it to you later if you want to email me. And all his publications are there. It's absolutely fascinating. And you can trace through the history by looking at each of his publications, what was happening in that mosque, who was coming, who was going. Now, in that film, they mentioned the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. And it was at that Diamond Jubilee that this very famous person came, Abdul Karim. This is a, a real-life portrait of him. Uh, painted by Rudolf Swoboda in 1888. He was later on, came, came as a servant, but ended up as the Indian secretary to Queen Victoria. She really, really liked him. If anybody's seen the film, she was really fond of him. He actually took care of her better than her own son, Albert, who, didn't, who wanted her to die, basically, didn't he? Because he, she was getting on a bit. <laughs> he wanted to take her place on the throne. Um, Right until her dying um, days, he, he helped her. He introduced curries as well into Buckingham Palace. Tandoori chicken is on the menu at um, Buckingham Palace by this stage. He was treated very badly. As soon as Queen Victoria passed away, he was expelled back to India again. He used to go to a different place now that appeared in Woking. So this is... That place, this is the very first purpose-built mosque which opened in Woking. Again, this is a real-life drawing of that mosque. And there is a little video here about two very important people, again, white British-English gentlemen who set, basically, Islam in this country. So this is um, that video now. <coughs> But with Quilliam's departure, Muslim life found a new focus in Surrey. In 1889, a mosque had been founded here at Woking as a place for Indian students to study and worship. And it soon became the headquarters for two new converts whose mission was to continue to challenge British intolerance of Islam. The first was a feather in Islam's cap, one of the highest ranking members of the British aristocracy. Baron Headley uh, was an Irish peer. He was born in 1855. Uh, he pursued a career in civil engineering. He spent a great deal of time in India, and that's where he came into contact with Islam. In 1913, Lord Headley Headley converted and began to attend Woking Mosque. Extraordinary film from the time shows Edwardian ladies alongside Muslims from all walks of life. And it was this unusual combination of genteel English culture mixed with Islamic values that Headley capitalized on to try and dismantle hostile British stereotypes of Islam. So for example, Lord Headley was involved in uh, activities such as at homes, all sorts of people uh, would gather and they uh, have tea and cakes. And they mingled knowledge of Islam with cultural activities and there would be uh, renditions on the sitar, um, English ladies uh, um, playing the piano. By introducing Islam in a context familiar to Edwardian high society, Headley made the religion seem less alien, more English. They needed to be creative and innovative in their approach so that uh, Islam became very much part of this environment. So that one could actually feel quite comfortable with uh, uh, Islam if, uh, if that's what it meant. Headley's work was another step towards breaking down British prejudice against the Muslim faith. But tea parties went only so far. It was the work of yet another Woking convert, which has perhaps had the most enduring impact on Islam in Britain. His name was Marmaduke Pickthorn, and his greatest achievement was to become the first English-born Muslim to translate the Quran into English a groundbreaking work that made Islam accessible to non-Muslims. 
He was born in 1875 and brought up in the Church of England. But as a teenager, he visited the Middle East. It was an experience that changed his life. He quickly seemed to gel with the local people. Very quickly he was speaking Arabic and he speaks about the friendliness of the people. There was a social cohesion there and it was, he believed, united by this overarching belief in Islam. I mean, he, he says uh, very significantly, he said, he said, for the first time I was happy. He was happy. India, which became his home for the next two decades. But although he was nearly 5,000 miles away, his actions would still have a huge impact on Muslims back in Britain. It was here that he undertook the most important work of his life, a pioneering translation of the Quran from Arabic to English. Published in 1930, it was seen as a milestone in the history of translation. This is an early edition of Pechthor's translation of the Quran, and the remarkable thing is that it's the first time a believing Muslim has translated the Quran, who was also a native speaker of English. He was also a, uh, an accomplished writer, and he transfers all these skills to his translation of the Quran. By producing a more objective translation in a language understandable to a wider audience, Pickthel was breaking down prejudice. There has always been a suspicion of a holy book in a strange language. So he was making the Quran accessible. And if there has been a kinder and more tolerant appreciation of Islam, it has been through Pickthel's translation. And there was somewhere back in Britain that particularly welcomed it. Woking Mosque, Pickthel's base before he left for India. At a time when it seemed all of Britain was against him, it was the one place he had felt at home. Pickthel, like William and Headley before him, helped to demystify Islam, and his work continues to inform and encourage new generations. remained in India, but he returned to Britain at the end of his life. Okay, do you want to see that very first Quran? I've actually got it here. Okay, there it is. Marmaduke Pickthel, that's the very first Quran um, translated in English by um, a Muslim person. And even nowadays, this is the modern version, it's still got Marmaduke Pickthel's name at the bottom. So a lot of Muslims who are born, brought up here like myself, British Muslims, the first translation they would always read, it's usually always is Marmaduke Pickthel's. So here's the modern version. You are allowed to come and have a look at some of these bits later. Right, let's move on. Now, in that mosque, there was another magazine. They basically copied the idea that... Um, the previous gentleman had done, um, I think it was William, wasn't it? William Quilliam. So here is another magazine. Uh, it's called the Islamic Review. And this, is, this picture is the very first issue um, that was done. And again, the website at the top, someone has found them and, and uploaded all, all the issues of the magazine very, very interesting. You can go on the website and you can have a look at what was going on in the mosque right way back into Victorian times. Um, and I've already showed you the translation of Marmaduke Pickthel's first Quran, um, which I showed you there. The very um, next landmark in history, remember we're going forward in time now to modern times, sort of modern times, is the First World War. Now remember, Britain was Great Britain by this stage, and nearly three quarters of the world was ruled by the British in Queen Victoria's era. So the, in the First World War, Britain needed soldiers to help fight with them. They didn't have enough manpower, so they used lots and lots of soldiers from all the lands that Britain owned, and lots of those lands were Muslim lands. 
So by 1913, the British Empire um, was vast. Um, and did you know that approximately 1.3 million Indian soldiers served in World War I? And over 74,000 of them lost their lives. And did you know that out of all of that figure, it's roughly one million were Muslims? So um, most of these came from farming areas, such as the Punjab. Jhelum was the big territory, actually. The British Army territory was right there in Jhelum, uh, which is now Pakistan. So you get a lot of um, third, fourth generation Pakistanis in Britain whose great granddads might have come over in the First World War. That's why you get out of the Muslims, you get Pakistanis the most because they came over during the war. Azad Kashmir, the northwest frontier as well. Um, these were all the recruiting grounds for the British Army and the Merchant Navy. What's the next landmark now that we can look at where more Muslims come over? We've done the First World War, what's the next one? Second World War, someone said, yes. So again, um, Again, some of the lands um, where soldiers were used were Muslim lands, and millions and millions of Muslim soldiers came over. I know, actually, quite a few of my friends, their um, granddads or great-granddads actually fought in the Second World War. Um, your granddad did, yes. And they've still got the medals and things as well. They're very proud, very proud, just like... You know, some of the, the white British people who have fought in the war, they, they want to tell their grandchildren, and, and it's the same with Muslims. You know, they want to tell the grandchildren. Now, what's the situation of England after the war? <laughs> no money, that's correct. No money, the land's in ruins, yes? They need manpower to build up the land again, and they need cheap labour, because they haven't got the money. So, what they did was... They used, again, it was, well, let's put the slide up. So this is a boat carrying workers to the docks in London. This was an answer to Britain's desperate labor shortage after the war. Nearly 500 men, the first immigrants that came over war from Jamaica. And this is just telling you, for example, the history and then later on all the other countries. This marks the symbolic start of mass immigration, not from Europe, but from the Commonwealth. They are encouraged by adverts for work, their sense of patriotism, and some want to rejoin the armed forces having fought already for Britain during the war. The British Nationalities Act gives all Commonwealth citizens free entry into Britain, and they were welcomed. So this is... Um, and did you know, for some of these people, they were earning six times more in England than they were in their own countries six times more. So for them it was a good thing to come here, yet Britain was getting good out of them by giving them less money than they would have um, to others. Um, another very big trauma happened um, in the Punjab region at this point as well. And basically in Pakistan, which is the area of Pakistan now, there was, um, the, there was a big dam there which broke down and all the water came into all the villages and flooded the whole land. And that was the same area where the British Army was, and they're the ones who had brought... Um, all of these people had helped Britain in the, in the war, so then Britain felt they needed to give something back. So it would have taken them millions of pounds, really, to build up their village that was completely submerged. And Britain said, come over here and we can help you. So a lot of Muslims came over in the 60s from the Mirpur area. Now, this is another very important thing. A lot of Pakistanis, you'll find they're from these areas because of this, um, what happened. Okay, what happens in Africa, meanwhile? Good, well done. Very clever people in the audience today. So we came across this man, E.D. Amin. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but um, basically he um, encouraged a policy of Africanization. And this was all happening in Kenya and Uganda. And life became very difficult for some of the Muslims that were living there. And again, Britain has been very, very good. Can you see how Britain is changing over the ages? 
They're being very tolerant. So in 1972, 60,000 Asians were expelled by President Idi Amin from Uganda, many of whom were allowed to settle in Britain. And then after that, we're now moving across the ages. We've done the 70s. We're going into 80s now. Okay? And basically, there was um, a Bosnian war, wasn't there? Do you remember? There was the big genocide that was going on there. And I actually remember that time quite well, because I was living in London at the time. And um, there was a huge number of Bosnian Muslim women who came over because of all this genocide that was going on. A lot of the men were killed, and the sons were killed. And there were a lot of widows who um, England was very, very good, actually, to give them refuge to. And they came here. Um, this is actually a real-life picture of some of their husbands and uh, sons in, in their graves. So that was the next influx of Muslims. And then we've got joining the EU. I know we're exiting them now, but when we join the EU, um, again, um, going, you know, coming to modern times, a lot of Muslims did come over from some of these lands. They were either Muslim to begin with, especially like in Romania, uh, but, or some of them came here and married Muslim uh, men who were living here and then became Muslim. I actually do know quite a lot of Hungarian and Czech Republic um, ladies even now who, who became Muslim. And then in recent times, after 9-11, we've got the Iraq War, we've got Afghanistan, we've got Syria, Sudan, all of those. Again, England has been very, very good in um, welcoming them all, really, to Britain and giving them such privileges, really. Muslims do re actually recognize this. Um, so at the moment, Islam is the second largest religion in England, and there are 2.4 million, at the moment, Muslims living in England. So that comes to the end, and now I'm going to take questions in the last three minutes. <laughs> but we're, when we go out and have our lunch in a minute, you can ask me whatever you like. Okay, any questions? Did you find that all interesting? Mm -hmm. Yes? You learned a lot. Yes? You mentioned what the Islamic world sent to England by way of trade. What did they receive in return? Money. <laughs> when you trade goods, you get money, don't you? Yes? And I'm sure there must have been English things here that, you know, clothes, for example, uh, they, 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 they would have taken back the ideas and things like that. Of course, England had lots of things as well, so uh, they, they, they would have taken back maybe English herbs back there as well, you know, things like that. What was that, sorry? Yeah, herbs. Yeah, herbs. Yeah, herbs. Yes. Yes. Great. You've got a lot of history in your family, haven't you? <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Oh, that's really great. That's great. Um, did you have a question over there? You mentioned about all the history of Islam during the 9th and between the 20th century. Did you have or have an influence over the Western countries, including Britain? Uh, not only in terms of invention, but also in broader terms, maybe in uh, academically or scientifically, yeah. uh, did different get all Western Europe get something uh, from Islam or some country, especially in that period. Yeah. Afterwards, uh, I think there's uh, not so much happening, but maybe let me uh, mention Yes, yeah, definitely. The trading um, times was the main. When, when all the new inventions came over, the currency, the decimal currency, the gold, everything, the, the fashions, it, that's the most <coughs> biggest time. You just need to go into the golden age of Islam um, and, and you can Google that.